Sarah Fimalvanides, and I am delivering this uh, workshop on behalf of uh, GISIS for CESDA. I will say a few words about CESDA as well. And, and I have um, around 20 years experience of using geographical information systems, both in terms of researching and doing substantive research or research methodologically in relation to the data, and, and also delivering teaching and training. However, this is the first time we're delivering this specific um, webinar, and in particular online. I have delivered before, but face-to-face. Uh, -face. So please uh, have some patience with us, and also um, we will appreciate your feedback, as I say, in the end. And um, Amir, would you like to introduce yourself too? So yes, uh, thank you, Seraphim. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Amir Tavimi. Uh, uh, I have a PhD in urban and regional planning. I studied my second master in GIS and I started my professional career in uh, special data analysis uh, back in 2004 uh, as a GIS expert, urban planner expert, and as a GIS trainer. I hope I can help you in this webinar with the help of uh, Seraphim, and we can uh, help you teach, uh, to help you learn some 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 useful skills for spatial data analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Okay, I will uh, now share my presentation. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I hope you're at the right uh, webinar. If you had the correct link, then you should be here at the right place. And I already announced the logistics. And I said I would uh, say a few words about SESTA. SESTA's mission is to um, provide uh, research infrastructure, enabling the research community to conduct uh, high quality research in the social sciences. So it's mainly targeting social sciences, although increasingly um, other types of data and um, contributing to solutions and um, major challenges that we are facing today. For example, uh, the development goals or other challenges like uh, uh, wars, etc. And at the core of uh, CESDA's mission is to facilitate teaching and learning in the social sciences. And this is part of organizing training events like this. However, SESTA also has a range of digital tools. You can see there the SESTA data catalog, which makes uh, available all the data sets from the various service, data service providers, and a European question bag, vocabulary service for the translation of questions, etc. And at the bottom, on the right-hand hand side, you can see uh, there is a data management expert guide focusing on supporting researchers to prepare data management plans and understand the challenges behind managing data and how they can plan, organize, document, process, etc., the data sets. And as I mentioned, this is part of the training that CESTA provides. And you can see here it is an upcoming event that is happening now. But if you want to find out more about other types of events, you can see there on the 6th of September, there is a Dataverse training event. Uh, they are mostly free unless they are organized by service providers who charge. So that's briefly uh, the background on SESTA. And this is what we will be doing today. I will give a very brief introduction to GIS. I will not take more than 15 minutes. And uh, my assumption is that although you are uh, new to QGIS, I think most of you are, a uh, few people have used GIS before but at least you have some understanding of why you would like to map data, what sort of data you would like to map. And I also distributed a video that I had prepared earlier, a couple of years ago, explaining why it is important to, uh, or why such scientists may want to map data and, and why it is important that uh, you maybe want to add this skill to uh, your skill set. Then we will have a very short exercise to make sure that you all have uh, access to QGIS as we expect you to before we progress to the first part of the workshop, which is mostly focusing on working with tabular data. Then we will have a break 
Uh, then Amir will take over with a special data analysis part and we will close at around um, quarter past four with questions and answers. What I would like to stress is that um, we conceived it slightly differently in the beginning and then we realized how many people had signed up. So because it will be difficult to have one-to-one -one interaction with you, uh, we kind of simplified the workshop. So, so this is a very sim a much simpler version of what we had in mind. If you manage to follow along, then we have extra exercises for people who are faster <laughs> than, than the average. And you can, um, in the spare time, you can kind of work along the extra exercises. If not, then um, we are hoping that everyone will at least achieve the, the main um, maps that we want you to produce today. Okay, so a very short introduction. And as I said, I am a researcher and academic and I have done quite a lot of uh, research using GIS and also on substantive matters. So as a, as a means of introduction, I'm showing you here uh, one of my uh, publications from seven years ago, where we were looking at uh, urban sprawl in European cities. And I am showing you this for a number of reasons. I know we have participants here from all around the world, but uh, the kind of data we will be using today is mostly European data. Well, it is exclusively European data, actually. And it is uh, data available to be downloaded freely. And this is, if you follow this uh, publication, you will see that um, I'm using similar data there to look at how the cities around Europe sprawl. Sprawl, urban sprawl means how they expand. And... Uh, how fast this happens and in what, uh, not only at what rate, but in what fashion it happens, and also what the potential implications may be of this urban sprawl and the causes. And in general, it is considered something negative, so how can it be reduced or stopped? And although there are debates about whether urban sprawl is uh, positive or a negative, uh, or can have positive or negative effects. And here uh, you can see other reasons why uh, social scientists may want to map. Uh, we are interested in seeing patterns of uh, phenomena. On the left-hand side, you have population density in Europe. It is plotted as dots, as points on the European map. Every point um, represents a certain number of people. You cannot see it as points. You just see the overall pattern, the concentration around cities. And on the right hand side, you see the same kind of data, but um, represented as, uh, as polygons. And this is NATS level data that we will discuss again today. And again, the reason why I'm showing you this data is because it is related to the kind of exercise we will be having today. The other reason why I am showing you this map is, of course, it, there is an interest in the patterns that we observe, and you can follow the links to the various publications. Is it good? Is it bad? What is happening with the concentration of uh, people in cities or in certain urban areas? But um, you can see here how the impression you get from this map is different depending on whether you're looking at the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And one is a representation of points, as I said earlier. The right-hand side is the polygons. You can see how some of the patterns become diffused. For example, in these urban areas that you can see around Cologne, um, in Germany, etc., you can kind of sense that the colors are darker, darker, but the impression is not as strong. And when you go to Athens, it's a kind of lost and the fact that uh, the Athens, Athens is so densely populated. So there is something here to be said about how do we actually map data, what sort of um, underlying data we are using and what sort of visualizations we are using. Now at the core of uh, this concept of GIS, and um, what you need to remember is that uh, it is highly reductionist. Um, it is one of the major criticisms, of course, of uh, the datafication and digi digitization of all this data, that all this complexity and richness that we see, and the data we collect, etc., 
becomes reduced into this concept of layers. You will experience this today with the various exercises. You will see that we start talking about variables and interesting things, and then we reduce everything to something really simple, like is it a, a boundary layer or is it a point layer or whatever, okay? So in order for uh, the geographical information to understand the geographical data, we have to simplify it. And the simplification happens through this um, layering approach. So what we have here is roads, and they are represented, as you can see here, as lines. Land uses are represented usually as regions or polygons. Boundaries can be represented, again, as lines, but they contain areas, for example, countries, cities, etc. Then you have a hydrography layer. We will not use any of these kind of layers or elevation, um, but um, that's what you need to have in mind. We will constantly be talking about different layers. The data you downloaded already will be perceived as layers. The other thing um, that I would like to point out here is that another layer of reduction is how these layers are represented. I mentioned, for example, that roads are represented as lines. And the question is, should roads be lines or should they be something else? Um, and this depends a lot on the scale that we are using and on the type of data and the way that the data has been collected. So again, a second layer, level of uh, reduction in, in your mind is whether things are represented as points, lines, or polygons or regions. This is standard GIS terminology that we will be using and you will see later today. And another layer of uh, abstraction is whether things are represented in a GIS as vectors, as we say, whether they have exact coordinates, like the points, the lines, and the polygons I mentioned earlier, or whether they are represented as rasters, as images. We will not be using any raster data today or image-based data, but you can see here at the bottom, you have image-based which is, um, for example, scanned maps or aerial photographs or satellite images. These are all types of um, raster data. So today we will be focusing on vector data. Um, we will be focusing on points and polygons. We will not do much with lines. And uh, we will use some very basic uh, spatial analytical techniques, but we will not delve into um, more complex data sets like uh, grids or rasters, etc. Here's another example from a previous publication that demonstrates this concept of uh, the layering and the simplification that we have. For example, we have secondary schools, you can see here now, represented as points. Okay, it doesn't matter what the map actually shows, you can follow up the publication. It has to do with uh, the way children attend schools in uh, South Africa. Um, and you can see here the simplification. We have the points representing uh, the various schools. The color of the point, the points represents the pass rate for the pupils in those schools. And then we have these um, school districts. So these areas are school districts now polygons or regions, as we call them in GIS terminology, and then you have the pass rate at the regional level. And this is a comparison between the region level and, and pass rates for, for uh, children and the specific school level pass rates. Okay, so you can see here um, the, all the aspects I mentioned earlier. Uh, another thing you want to have in mind, and Amir will expand more on this in the third and final part of today's workshop, is the fact that once you um, have in mind this concept of points, lines, polygons, you can then do a um, more advanced level of analysis. For example, you can create catchment areas or zones of influence around these features. And the catchment area for a point, for example, for a school that I mentioned earlier, would be a buffer or a region or an area, okay? Then for the lines here, these lines could be streets or it could be river streams, etc. It would be a polygon again. 
And then around polygons, the red ones here, they may be buildings or something, you may create a buffer, which is again a polygon. And this is, I'm pointing this out, as I said, Amir will mention it again in the final part, because there is an exercise later on on how to create these buffers and how to overlay them, etc. So this is something I wanted to highlight. It's one of the strengths of GIS. Once the data is cleaned and ready, and we know what the data is about, and we can then do and uh, perform this kind of analytical, uh, special analytical uh, techniques. And you can see here in another publication how we used um, points uh, of uh, health services. So health services were points, and then we used um, a technique which is to create catchment areas around these points, but they are not the buffers that we saw earlier. They're not nice and tidy and round. They are a little bit more complex because they follow their road, their road network. And then uh, we have superimposed them on top of urban blocks um, in a city, in Oaxaca, to see what part of the population is served by these health services. So you can see here how uh, a simple technique that I mentioned earlier can be used um, in analytical terms for uh, actually carrying out the research. And I will not go into more detail into the GIS uh, aspects. I just wanted you to understand the concept of layering, the concept of different representations of features, points, lines, polygons, the fact that we can do certain things with them, like expand them, create catchment areas, and overlay them. And um, you will see um, most of these things in our example. However, what I would like to mention is that there is a geographical information system of the Commission. And it, to a certain extent, it is a GIS, an online GIS, because it has the underlying data. You can see there the databases and it has some very basic tools. You cannot do uh, many sophisticated things. You can simply create maps and in some cases kind of change the representation. And Eurostat also, um, of course, offers uh, European geo data. You can see here the different administrative units. Uh, this is where I downloaded the data for my publication, the first one that I showed you, and as well as the data that we will be using today. You can download data on population distribution, transport networks, land cover, etc., and elevation. So you can, you can download also grid or raster level data from this website. And however, uh, what I want to show you, oh, this is a little bit dated as an image because since then we have the uh, more recent NATS data that you downloaded today. And so you can also download administrative units from this website. I, uh, I managed to finish a little bit um, earlier than I thought and because I am very keen to make sure that um, everyone has First of all, download the data that uh, we asked you to download. And many of you responded and uh, I have the responses and, and I can see that in general there were no problems. And also that you managed to install QGIS and change the language setting. This is very important. I have an anecdote here. I tried to deliver a European level uh, event and uh, People came in with, with their own laptops from so many countries in, in Europe. And when we started um, the workshop, I realized that, uh, of course, it had reverted to the setting of everyone's uh, native la uh, laptop uh, language and was uh, very difficult to then switch um, on the fly. So it would be great if you could do that beforehand. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen first of all and then look at the q a okay we have a few minutes i have a point shape file another one in csv file the point layer uh one variable name the same point okay. sorry, my, i'm already yes. answering actually yeah great okay thank you Amir. excellent so um this though uh, reminds me that while i am delivering amir if it is simple things that uh, amir can uh, respond to and he will respond on the Q&A. Um, if it is something more complicated that we need to stop and address for everyone, um, then Amir will notify me so that we can do this. 
So this is the communication we will have. Sometimes the questions can be responded very quickly, and sometimes they, I will have to stop and take stock. Okay, um, so let's um, first of all start with the first Okay, you have to give me a, a minute or so to switch between the various screens. I will assume, let me see. Please, could you send a link to the data to download for the exercises? Uh, sorry, there, was, there is also something on the chat. Um, Susan and for others, we did send uh, an email with all the information about how to download the data. Um, we will also, Amir may be able to send you the file about downloading the data so that you can do it uh, now. Okay, I will share my screen very quickly and um, just to show you what it should look like if everything has worked well. Okay, when we open QGIS for the first time ever, we may see all sorts of things there. Um, and then when we open it again, we usually see what uh, we were working on the previous time. So here you can see all sorts of things that I have been working uh, with. Um, but the important thing is that when you open it, usually it opens with an untitled project, you can see here, and in English, or if you have changed the settings, then it should be in English. Okay. So. So unless I see anything on the Q&A, I will assume that everyone is able, forget what you see on my screen, to open QGIS and see the menus in English. And then we can continue. Okay. Ah, okay. Pa uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I should not be mentioning names. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Someone is saying that it looks like the questions are visible only to the trainers, but some questions may be relevant to everyone. This is actually a very good point. Um, so maybe how can we address this? Um, okay. So here's my suggestion. If you feel, <laughs> if you feel that um, you are stuck with something and you suspect you are the only person who is stuck, maybe it's better if you put it on Q&A. And if you feel that, um, you, and you don't mind sharing on the chat, etc., with others, um, you may want to ask on the chat. So thanks for pointing this out. This is a very good point. Um, and uh, we will also be checking then the chat uh, box. Okay, so we will start then with the exercise. And the way this will work is I will share with you a file on the chat uh, which contains the exercise, but please don't start doing it. And um, this is for you to have uh, next to you and, or to open it in another device. I will run through the exercise, not the whole exercise, just the first couple of steps. And then I will ask you to follow. Um, and you will have this uh, file that I will send you so that you can um, um, kind of follow the exercise step by step. So we will be doing this in small steps, okay? We will be doing it every three minutes. I will stop, check, if someone is stuck, Amir will uh, step in to support you, um, or I can respond as I did so far. Um, and please do not uh, try to do the whole exercise in five minutes, because it would be nice if we are, if we try to be all together. Okay, so 
give me a second please. Okay, I'll wait for 30 seconds to, to make sure that everyone has access to this link. It should have worked now. Excellent. Okay, so given that you have all now um, accessed and downloaded the file, I just want to go very briefly through the exercise and explain what, what the purpose will be. So as you may have guessed, um, I was talking about population level da or nuts, uh, data, populations, etc. So the aim will be to recreate um, these kind of density maps. I have a link here. You can go to the Statistical Atlas viewer and you will be able to see that the kind of data we will be using in this part of the practical is available uh, um, from Eurostat. And there is also a visualization tool that you can create on the left hand side. You can see the project population change. And remember the terminology we used in the beginning, points, lines, polygons, etc. You can see here that the symbols are actually points and they have been inflated to reflect the size of the population on January 2020. And they have colored these points with different colors here to show the projected change. You have the lines of the boundaries for the nuts. And then you have also the regions. The boundaries are actually defining the regions at the same time. This is more clear on the right hand side map where they have used a different representation. They are using the NATS three level data. This is the lowest level of data you can get hold of from NATS. There is NATS four, there is even NATS five. Uh, these are administrative boundaries, but the data becomes mostly available at NATS level three. Um, and you can see here what they have done is they have calculated population density for 2019. So this is people per square kilometer. And they have mapped it with a dark blue, um, the lighter areas, and then with a dark red, the areas above 1000 people per square kilometer. Now, there's all sorts of things we can say about these maps and deconstruct them <laughs> and endlessly. And uh, you have to be careful when you read these maps because the first impression I get is I'm looking at these blue areas and I think, oh, this is interesting. Something is happening here. In fact, what is happening in these blue, dark blue areas is that the population density is very low. So if someone wants to stress the low population density, then this is a nice uh, visualization. But if someone is interested in the high population density, which is usually what we are interested in, then they should have thought about the color scheme a little bit better. And this is the limitation now. You could use this atlas, statistical atlas view, produce a map like this, and then you have no further control over how to manipulate this map. While if you download the data and use a QGIS, a QGIS or any other GIS, you are able to actually make changes to the map. And this is the purpose of uh, this first part. So we ask you to download these data sets. You can see here the different NATS level, the different formats, the points, lines, polygons that we mentioned earlier, and even the coordinate reference system. All this will become a little bit more clear as we go along through the workshop. The scale, we downloaded the data at the finest scale, which is one to one million, which sounds strange, but for this kind of purposes and this kind of visualizations is actually a, a decent scale to use because we are looking at Europe as a whole. Um, we downloaded the most recent NATS data for this exercise. And here, as I said, there is points, lights, polygons. We asked you to download the polygons for the final part of today's workshop. We um, realize that it may be a good idea to also download the points, but let's not discuss this for the time being. We can revisit this during our break. 
And here you can see the different geometries and uh, different types of geographical data you can download. I did not really expand on this in my introduction, but over the years, there are um, different um, formats that geographical data is being uh, collected, produced, analyzed, etc. We will be using what we call a shapefile format, and this is the SHP. It is a little bit more complicated than this, and I will explain it at uh, the workshop. This very annoying visualization that you will see on the website is actually very significant. You will see later why this is so important to understand what they are trying to tell us with this, with this visualization instead of explaining it with words. So we will move on to do some data wrangling, as we say, and, and then continue with some mapping. And this is just a summary of what we will do. Most of these things don't mean anything to you, but by the end of the hour, uh, you should have a much better idea of what is happening here. So we will map these four uh, NATS levels. We will select some features from NATS level three, save it as a separate shape file. We will do some uh, joins of the tables. We will do some calculations. And then we will map the outcome so aiming basically to reproduce this map, but with different colors. And then we will conclude the exercise by exporting uh, what we created as an attribute table in case we want to use it further. And as I said in the beginning, we have a few extras here where you can experiment with different colors, etc. These extras will come to you in the training package, even if we don't have time today to cover them. Okay, so uh, what you need to remember is this terminology that QGIS is using. You are able to open it, and I will be referring to the menu bar, which is this top menu that you see here. Then I refer to these things here as buttons or icons sometimes. There are these toolbars as well. So sometimes um, they may be referred to as toolbars because they open other menus. Then we have what we call the panels. There is the browser panel, which I usually close down. I don't need it because um, this layer panel becomes very complicated once you start working with data. And the all important map view, which is what where all our actions are shown, you know, the results of our um, actions. And finally, um, Number five is the status bar down here. Sometimes when we run operations that take time, uh, you can see some sort of bar moving up and down. You see the coordinate system, the scale, and how uh, what the zoom is. So these are very important terms that we use, but it doesn't always look this way. Sometimes you can close down, you can see here the indicators, you can close, close down the various, um, what are they called, the various panels. <laughs> And that means that uh, everyone's QGIS in the end may look slightly different than a graphical user interface. And I'm making the point here that depending on the type of software you use, it may also look very different. Okay, so as I said, I will first um, do something. Okay, so I will uh, follow slides uh, one, two, and three. And then I will give you a couple of minutes to do it yourself. So, um, I will double check with Amir. Amir, can you see the QGIS now? Not yet, sir. Not yet, okay. Okay, in this case, the sharing didn't work as expected. So, I will. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's start then. Um, so the first step is we start with a new project. We can do this either by saying project new up here or by clicking this white empty page. And you can see immediately that everything changed now. As I said earlier, it may not look the same like yours because I have modified slightly my screen. And um, I prefer having here only the layers. And um, 
because it gets very busy, you will see once you start loading uh, the different layers. And the first thing we do is, I didn't talk about projections, Amir will talk about them, but there are ways to represent the various coordinates and do the transformations from the uh, geographical coordinates to the space Cartesian coordinates, etc. The data we downloaded is in a specific uh, system. Uh, remember, you had to choose it earlier, and uh, we will use the same system here. So we will specify here for the project the properties. Okay. Amir, can you also see the project properties? Yes, the pop up is also. Okay. Excellent, it's visible. Uh, um, so we will specify here under CRS, the project coordinate system. We will filter using um, EPSG3035, which is the one we used when we download the data. It's a European centered system. You can see the change here uh, and then apply and then OK. Nothing changed because we haven't loaded anything yet. Um, but once we start loading data, they will um, start overlaying because we are using the same kind of system. The next thing we do, if we want to open a data set, we open a data source manager, which opens another window. I mentioned earlier, we will be working with vector data. So you can see here all the different types of data we can upload, for example, raster, etc. We are focusing on vector. Then we need to go and find our data set. And um, sorry, you see my all my data here, but here it is. In there, there is the NAT level regions. You may have fewer data because uh, I did some analysis. Um, and the interesting thing is that it can open the zip file in theory. Let's see if this works. So you don't need to unzip it. Open, you leave this as it is, add and close. And we have the NATS data that we downloaded. Um, Usually what happens at this point is people start moving things around um, or clicking or zooming in and out by mistake and then you end up in the middle of uh, the seat not knowing where you are. This happens a lot to everyone, including to myself. When this happens, you go on the layer name, right click, and then there is an option here, zoom to layer. And then usually it works and you come back to the original zoom of the layer. Now, in theory, we should be, actually, this should be the zoom, right? But because we have all these islands and regions and areas that belong to countries but are far, far away, the zoom of the layer ends up being at this scale. You don't need to worry about it. However, what we need to do is to also change the CRS of the layer. So we set the CRS for the project. We need to also set it for the layer. And here you can do it this way, set project CRS from layer. Or it's better if we open the properties and then source. And then here we choose the project CRS so that the layer and the project CRS, everything in, is in the same coordinate system. Okay, and again, nothing changed, but uh, at least we are sure that all the data is now going to be sitting in the right coordinates. How do we know it's the right coordinates? And we can see at the, at the bottom here, the coordinate system, and we can see the coordinates down here, as well as the scale that the map is produced at. Okay, so these are the first uh, two steps. The next important thing we do, of course, we can start coloring the map with various colors, etc. But we will not do that yet because we don't really know what we uh, brought in. We downloaded some data. We know it's not three level. We can see it, interesting things here, uh, boundaries, etc. 
there is an identification tool that we can select, click, and then it tells us what this place is. So it's Iceland, and you can see here, but we want to see what is sitting behind this. And the important thing you need to remember here is that GIS is basically a set of tables combined together. There is a table that holds all these coordinates for all these areas, regions, etc. And there is another table that you have access to and you can edit it. So right click again, right clicking on the layer name is magic. It does many things and open attribute table or from the layer we can open also the attribute table here. So basically right clicking here opens this layer menu. It's very much similar. So we open the attribute table and now we have quite a familiar view. This is simply a table, okay? And it's like a table in Excel or in a spreadsheet or in a database, it has rows every row is an entry on the map it's a feature as we call it and every column is um, a field or a variable okay and we can order it very quickly here's the nuts id this is a unique identifier for all these little areas here there is a level code which is a magic thing that uh, we haven't really discussed yet we will come back to this. There is a country code, and people who understand the countries from the two letter codes will be able to tell which country is AL. It's Albania, UK is the UK. And then there are some, um, the Latin name or the Nats name here. Sometimes they vary, sometimes they are the same. And mountain type to show um, if this area is mountain urban type to show if this area is urbanized, coast type if it's close to the coast, and this FID, it's the feature ID. In this case, FID is exactly the same like the NATS ID. And it is important for your own data too, GIS operates on a unique identifier. So if you want to connect the entry of a table with something on the map, it is important that uh, the identifier is unique so that you can do the joints that we will see soon. So we have here NATS ID equals FID, so whichever we use in this case is fine. Okay, we want to explore a little bit this um, NATS layer table. So I keep sorting it through different ways. And one way of sorting it is this level code. Remember this annoying animation which had four different layers kind of overlapping. Well, what we did is we downloaded all four layers. There was no option to select only one layer. So here we have not only the NATS3 level, but also the countries and the areas below the countries and the other areas below the countries. So we have level zero is the country, but unfortunately we have layers levels one, two, and three as well. Why is this problematic? This is problematic because when we go to an area and select it, we have no idea what we are selecting. It is selecting actually everything that is underneath at all the different levels. So this is something I think they didn't think through very carefully when they thought they would provide the data to the people because it can lead into really misleading results. What we need to do is we need to go here and find a way to separate only the lowest level of NATS, NATS level three. And this is what I will show you after I give you a minute or two so that you can open to GIS, bring in this NATS zipped file and be able to see it on the screen and also to open the attribute table.
Amir, if there are any questions that I need to stop and respond to, please let me know. Thank you. Everything is okay, Seraphim. No question. All are okay. answered. Okay. And in this case, I'm moving to B4. B4 says um, mapping the four nuts levels. So um, instead of me, I mean, I can do this. Let me see very quickly. So we did B1, B2, B3. We explored this a little bit. Now we're in B4 mapping the four nuts levels. So this is the first uh, mapping we will try to do. Again, right click, properties, and now, uh, let's, okay, it unselected this. Uh, symbology is the next thing that you will be using a lot with QGIS. It's basically how you map things on the view. And here, we will try to map these different levels. We said there are four different levels. We will try to see what is happening here. Okay. So these are now categorical variables. It's a categorical variable. It's numeric, 0, 1, 2, 3, but it's actually a category behind it. So we use the categorized option. It was the level variable. Here it is, the level code. And then we use classify. We leave this as random colors, it doesn't matter. And we classify it. And depending on um, the mood of QGIS, you may get different colors here. <laughs> so um, we will keep it as it is. And then we will click OK. And we will see immediately the result on the screen. And the result is not very, um, let's say, exciting. It's quite messy, actually. Uh, because, as I said, the different layers overlap. So if we untick them, then you get to see the country level. Okay? So that's zero is the only thing we see now. These are the countries. If we click one, we can then see the next level. Okay? They have names, these things, large areas or regions, etc. You can see, for example, in the UK or in Greece. And then you have the next layer up, the level up. It starts getting messy in Turkey because the levels start getting mixed. So it's better if we untick all the others. And then finally, the level we are interested in, level three, there we are. However, this is not enough. We have simply visualized it. We have not really done any manipulation. So anything we try to do will apply to all these overlaying levels. We have to find a way to separate this level three from the mixed data set and create a new data set. Okay, so in slide B5, you can basically see the problem as I just described it. The four nuts levels came as a single layer, but they overlap. And this is now what this annoying animation means. It means these things are overlapping. And a trick I use is to always switch on here the feature count, because then you can see how many of these areas fall under each category. This is a very important piece of information to have so that you can understand a little bit your data. Okay, so you can see here 37 countries, and we are basically aiming to separate these 1,514 areas. If we open the attribute table again, you will see here that we have in total 2010 features. This is because all these areas overlay. So we have to find a way to separate these 1,514. Okay, there are many ways to do it. We could, for example, rank it and we could go and select these areas one by one, right? We could, for example, when we left click here and keep shift down, then we select areas. But it is a little bit painful to do this 1514 times. You can see here, as we select the areas, they are highlighted on the map. We could select the first one, scroll down, try to find the last one somewhere here. Uh, 
and then select all of them. But in the process, we select the few that are number two. So this is not a very safe way to uh, select data with uh, the attribute table. We need a little bit more of a scientific way. If we selected things by mistake or clicked on them, there is this little button here that says deselect features and then it deselects everything. Anything that is yellow on the screen, on the view, means that you have selected something. And this is dangerous sometimes because some of the operations only work on the selected features. So you need to make sure that this selected is set to zero and you don't see any yellow things on your screen. Okay, so we will try a different approach. We will try the scientific way. There is this selection button here, select features using an expression, which of course opens a little window. And then in here, we can write an expression, but we need to know what we are trying to write. And sometimes the terminology of how you write is very specific. It's basically SQL uh, uh, writing uh, script or we can do it by clicking. So we know we are looking for a field that is called level code, double click on it. And we know that this level code should be equal to something. And if we forgot what it should be equal to, we check here all the unique values and we can see the unique values zero, one, two, three. We click on three, double click on three. And this is basically the expression. And as I said earlier, of course, we can also type in. These spaces here don't matter. We can have many spaces or we can have one space. Usually I leave one space between. And this is the expression that we apply then to the table. Here we have many different selections about the selected features, but because we are doing a new selection, we just say select these features. Okay, and now we are confident that on the attribute table, only the level three code has been selected. And this is why we see everything. We can close the attribute table now. We can close this too. The selection remains, and we can see that all these areas are yellow. Unfortunately, it's not easy to see here on the main screen, if the features have been selected, you need to open the attribute table and then it tells you that 1,514 features have been selected, which is how many are the three. That's why this is also important. Okay. Once we select these, we can now right click, export to save these features. Um, as I said, there's usually two or three different ways to do these kind of things. And I prefer this way from export save features. And then here we want a shape file. We will save it again as a shape file. Uh, we want the same CRS, remember, we selected the CRS, it's 3035, so we want it to remain the same. We can switch it if we want to the project CRS, it's exactly the same here. Then it starts becoming complicated, we don't want to change it, okay? And then here, we go nuts3. I pre-created the folder, but you can create a new folder. And I call this folder NATS, something meaningful, NATS3SHP. And in there, I will give a name. And the name I give is the name of the data set I had originally, and I add this number three. So what I'm trying to do here is to remind myself that this data comes from the NATS level data at 1 million for 21 on the projection 3035. And I just add the three there to make sure that this is level three data only. And then I save it. Here we can choose 
for example, different fields if we want to omit any, but let's save all the fields as they are. And then, okay. In my case, it's asking if it should override the file because I already had a file like this. Otherwise, it will simply uh, create it. Okay. And then it loaded. And now we have an interesting case. Now we have uh, two layers here on the left. You can see the one we just mapped with all the different levels. And this one, the one we just created, the dark one. And if we click now on this dark one, oops, sorry, I have the other one active. Ah, yes, I did something wrong, of course. Yes, I'm sorry, I will go one step back. I will show you what happened. I forgot one little detail. This may happen to you as well, so it's good it happened to me. When we export, in fact, it happens a lot. <laughs> um, when I exported, I exported the whole um, the whole data set. Basically, I created a copy of all the different layers. So I will do it again. And there you go, save. But the crucial thing is down here, where was it? Uh, save only selected features. In the practical, I highlight it, but sometimes I forget. You need to tick save only the selected features. And then when you click OK, it will override the file. And now it should work. There you go. If we click on one of them, now only one is highlighted here. You can see this. I am in some random place and I click a few. In this case, it was two because they are too close together. There it is, one again. So I'm confident now that uh, this is correct, but always, always, always double check with the attribute table. The attribute table is essential to constantly keep checking. So we can see here 1,514 features. When we check rank by level code, it's three. The NATS IDs now don't contain the countries. They only contain the most detailed level. And all the other features we retain, so they are there. Okay. That means we have um, two layers now. And the one that is on the top is the one that is drawn last. So if you get very confused there, I will open this. You pull it down and then the other one goes to the top. Okay, so if you think you're mapping the wrong layer, simply pull down or move up. And moving up is always a little bit trickier than pulling down and then you will map the correct one. Okay, so we selected our features. We're in B9 now, we're moving on. And unless Amir stops me, I will continue. Continue, Seraphim, please continue. Excellent, okay, thank you, Amir, okay. Right. Um, Okay, moving on to B9, we create the new shape file with the NAS3 boundaries. Let me share my screen with B9. Okay, here we are. We check the new layer attribute table, but it only connects. We did that, we opened it, we checked it. Um, and let's do a little bit of more exciting mapping now. Let's uh, leave aside here. You need to be a little bit careful to leave aside the one that we already had and just untick it but leave it there for the time being because we never know if things went wrong or if we do something wrong but remember we go into the properties of the new uh, nuts layer symbology and we will try now to map the country level data so let's map countries they are also categorized okay and we will map Country code. Country code. 
okay classify again you may get different colors here apply and okay okay this is a beautiful map of the countries and don't get misled now this is a different concept to this map okay so this is countries at the country level and um, this is country at the country level so we only have 37 of them here right and the boundaries define the country boundaries if you click on one of them in theory <laughs> but in practice it will not work because there's all these overlays you should be able to see this one country the countries we just created here is the nuts data the nuts three level data mapped with a code that is the country code so it is a little bit misleading what you see here when you click on it you don't get a country you get the nuts level data nuts three sorry i keep clicking two here is one okay so it doesn't select the whole country i just mapped it so that we get some interesting patterns here and and we know that things are working for us and there are ways of course from here to go to the countries etc we are not going to deal with this for the time being i just wanted you to see how to map the country level and remember always right click and switch on the show features count and here you can see nicely how many of these nuts three areas are within every country okay so again Albania, for example, has 12 of these NATS areas. The UK has 179. Okay, this was B9. B10. Um, we will now, we are confident that this um, extraction of NATS level 3 has worked. We will remove this extra layer that we downloaded, the, the original one, remove layer. Okay, remember we are not losing anything by removing layers from here they are still stored as shape files we just remove it from the view and and this layer is already saved as a shape file so we don't need to worry about it but we need to save the project we need to save all the work we've done so far and this view that we have so we go project save as and then we save the project so I'm going to save it as exercise two. Save, yes, I will override. In your case, you will not have any exercise two, so it will be fine. Okay, so the project is simply a set of instructions to tell QGIS, next time we open QGIS, or if we find the project and open it, or if we load it, this is how we want the screen to look like, and what we want it to look like, with this kind of setting, this kind of colors, and this kind of layers. And, and usually I save the project very close to the data so that I know which project you will realize once you do five or six different projects and you save the projects elsewhere, you will always um, get confused about which data is this project actually using. So I tend to save the project very close to where the data is. Okay, um, let me check very quickly. Amir, uh, thank you also for reminding me of the time because uh, uh, there is that issue as well. Uh, Seraphim, we have a question in the chat that you may answer. Okay. Um, um, and so the question is, can you repeat how to see every attribute for a specific country? Okay, this, this can be interpreted in many different ways. And uh, maybe you mean um, this option here, so feature count on and off this could, could be one thing that you may mean or how to open the attribute table which is this open attribute table and then you can see the attributes or you may mean here how do we actually get to see what the feature is in which case we click this i button identify and then we click on it and then it opens this here this little table this little table is actually the attributes from the attribute table. It's just instead of horizontal, we see them vertically, <laughs> okay, in a different format. So I hope I answered the question. Um, right. Um, 
yes, someone is asking, they selected the NAT3 level, they exported it, but when they click the polygon, it still highlights all the ones around it, etc. There's two things that may have happened here. One is maybe you made the same mistake that I made in the, when I exported the data, I forgot to click, to tick the selected data set only. So I will go to the presentation and we are at the, sorry. Seraphim, she answered that already, she has done this. Okay. So there's still a, oh, I did, okay. I did as in, I'm not sure what this means. I did as in, <laughs> I made it work or I did not? I, I did it properly. No, she answered me actually. She, uh, okay. she sel saved the uh, selected features only. Selected features. Okay, okay. so okay. yeah. Then, then we may have an issue that you need to select the right um, layer to highlight. And remember, if you're at the wrong scale and you click, it selects quite a few because you need to, there is a way to specify when you click here, what sort of radius of selection will happen. So you have to go in quite, quite in there to select or click and only see one. Um, so it may be a matter of scale or it may be a matter of which layer are you actually using here on the left, whether it's the right layer or whether it's the original layer, in which case there may be a problem. Uh, okay, so I will, uh, there is a question about how can I add columns of coordinates for each layer in the attribute tables, but we will come to that um, in the next few minutes. Okay, so we are now at step 11. We are confident that our uh, geographical data is clean and tidy. This is the data we wanted, but we downloaded population level data. And remember, it's a simple CSV file. I know some people downloaded it as a zipped file, and then there was a matter of unzipping it, but there was an option to download it as a CSV file. And if people haven't downloaded it as a CSV file and they cannot unzip it, please, let us know and uh, Amir can maybe send you the, um, the actual CSV or I can stop and we can repeat it. Um, but the way to bring in this data here is again through this open data source manager. But this time it is not vector data. It had no geography. It had an identifier, but no other geographical information. It was a delimited text, okay? So we're following the steps here on importing the delimited text. Okay, let's see. First of all, we have to find it. And as I said, in this case, unfortunately, this zipped file will not work. It will have to be a CSV open it, comma separated file. Okay, we don't want to discard any um, of the headers. Let's see what we can see here. It looks good. So the first line is the headers. The all important data is actually this one, this column, observed value. Everything else is of no use apart from the geo, which is also the identifier, but we will import everything and then we will uh, see how we can clean it up. So add and then close. And remember, uh, QGIS treats everything as a layer. It doesn't care whether it's a shape file or a grid file or even a, a CSV file, it's still a layer. It was imported here as an extra layer. We can open the attribute table of this layer, which is just a table, but the whole layer is only a table. And you can see here basically the data you downloaded. And 
A lot of this information is redundant. We will get rid of it. Here is the value, the population value. And here is the unique identifier. And when I tick here, you can see again that this file also came with all the different levels from the country level down. That's why when you look at the observed value, you have some really massive numbers here. This is a Europe, Europe EU 27 for 2020. It's the whole population. And then you have the different countries, etc., and then the different regions. So this uh, data set is also a little bit messed up, but we are not going to clean it. We will use it as it is in the hope that when we do the merge, the redundant information will be discarded and only the essential information will be kept. Okay. So let's go to the presentation. Um, we opened it, we saw it. It is there and it is a new layer. And then we will do this magic join. So um, because everything is treated as a table, in GIS, in most GIS, in QGIS as well. That means we can then do operations between tables, which is the purpose of this first uh, workshop. So to understand that there are tables that we are playing with here, and also that we can do things between these tables. So one of the most important things we do with tables is a join. Um, and remember, this will work when you have a unique identifier in both tables. So you need to be very clear and very certain about what this unique identifier is. Okay. So we will join the table. Um, uh, Seraphim, there is yes? a question in Q&A that you may answer. Okay. Uh, yes, okay, I will go back half a step, delimited, here we found the name, CSV, remember, and here, um, it doesn't matter what we have here, in a way, um, this one is, is better if we click no geometry, because we are confident there is no geometry there, sometimes the CSV that we want to import, contains coordinates itself. For example, it can be the X, Y coordinates of observations on the ground or people's addresses or something like that, in which case this may matter. In this case, in the particular case, uh, for the data set we are uploading, we have no geometry. So we just upload it as standard. But thanks for the question, it's a good question. Um, Okay, let's see. Let's try it again then because someone is uh, stuck. So we'll try. I will repeat the process and then I will um, remove one of the two files open here. So CSV, okay, it's a delimited text. CSV is the file format, UTF-8. Do not get rid of any of these. Leave the first record has field names, detect the types. Here, if we take point coordinates, then it will expect us to enter things, which of these fields is the point coordinates. So no geometry. I should have made this more clear in my slides. No geometry and then add and then close. And as I said, it would open again, but it doesn't matter. We can get rid of one of the layers and we are left with one. Okay, so hopefully this uh, has worked now for everyone. So we open now the properties of the NATS3 layer. And here, um, sorry about this symbology. Uh, 
we have the joints. I, I lost the, <laughs> I had only a little snapshot, so I couldn't see the joint. So this manages joints with other layers. Now, when we become more sophisticated, these kind of joints can be um, more complex. We can do joints between uh, geographical layers, but in this case, we'll keep it simple. We will join a table to our features, to our um, geographical layer, to our shape file. We create a new join, and then here the join layer is this complex name linear, which is the CSV table. The join field is where we have to be very careful and not accept the default. This can be anything. It's probably the first one that we can find. But the join field, as I say in my notes, is this geo for the And remember, I said in the beginning, that it could be the NUTS ID or it could be the feature ID. They are the same, we check that. Let's use the NUTS ID, okay? And then here is where we can get rid of all these extra fields that we don't need. We will only keep the geo and the observed value. The observed value was the population value. And if we leave things as they are, the new fields will have this really complicated name, so I prefer to change it a little bit. We will keep the demo so that we remember where the data came from, but we will shorten it. So when we open the attribute table, it will be a much shorter field. So these are the uh, specifications here, the CSV file, the join field is from the CSV file, the identifier, the target field is the NATS ID, then we only take the geo and the observed value to do a check and um, the custom field prefix. Okay, we click OK. Something has happened here. A join has been created, but it hasn't been applied yet. We can see if it's okay. Yes, okay, the join field, the target field, etc., etc. And then we apply the join. Something happened in the background. We don't know what yet. And then we click OK. And now, what is the best way to check what happened? Always open the attribute table. OK, we open the attribute table for the NUTS features. And now we can see that here there are two extra columns, the demo geo. So the unique identifier from the CSV file and the observed value for the, from the CSV file, which is the population. Nothing else changed in our shape file. We still have 1,514 features. And two extra columns were added. Anything that didn't match, any extra um, rows that were in the CSV file that were irrelevant because they were referring to countries, etc. they were left out. This is why I said we don't need to clean the CSV file. Okay, so when we switch here, we see, for example, the NATS3 level information. Okay, I will pause for a minute because this is a crucial step. If this has worked, then uh, we are um, two thirds into the workshop and we can then produce some maps and wrap up. But if this hasn't worked, then um, the join process, uh, to repeat the join process. Okay, I will repeat it one more time. It is a tricky one. I will also show you, first of all, remember properties for the layers. We can get rid of a join. If we realize it didn't work or something went wrong, we highlight it here and we minus and then okay. And then when we open the attribute table, it's gone. And what does this mean? This means that this join is in a way temporary, okay? It doesn't change the shape file. We haven't changed the shape file. We haven't saved extra information into the shape file. This join has been saved in a temporary way. And so we will repeat it, properties, 
as I said, it's a very important step. Join, add a new join. Here we select, we have to find, first of all, the CSV, but it's clever enough to know that there is here a layer that we may want to join the current layer to. The join field is the important thing. It's a geo, it's referring to the CSV, uh, the comma separated text file. Then we have the NATS ID. And remember here, we only select the geo, observed value, and in the custom field, we removed the extra information and we just kept them. And here, I don't think it makes any difference. So just leave it as it is. Click OK. The join has happened. We can inspect it. It looks correct. We want two fields only. Apply. OK. Open the attribute table. And this is what we see now. Also in slide B14, uh, sorry, B13, where we inspect the attribute table. Okay, I will assume everyone is following. And um, because once we have this new data, we need to do a couple of calculations. So now we start changing basically the shape file uh, gradually. Um, well, not yet, but when we save it, we will have changed it. Okay, remember we want to calculate density, so we need the area of every region and we need the population. The population we have already, it's here. The area we don't have. So what we will do is we will create a new field. Okay. We will create a new field and do the calculation in one go. There is a way to create a new field and then go in and recalculate it, but it takes a little bit longer. So we open the field calculator in the attribute table. Remember, this first part of the workshop is only playing with the attribute table. So we create a new field. This new field will be called uh, So it was one step ahead. Yes, okay, we are in P14. And we will create a new field. Remember, this uh, connection is temporary. So to make it permanent and to save this population data, we will create a new field, top 2021, leave everything as it is. And we will take this value from the fields. Here it is. Okay. So what are we doing here? And um, if we misplace the CSV file, if we save it somewhere else or delete it by mistake, and um, this extra information in the shape file will be lost forever. So we will have to repeat the whole process. To avoid this, one way is to create a new field, transfer the information, and then break the join, break the link. And this is what we are trying to do here. We are creating a new field, not a virtual field, a real field. So we will actually edit the shape file. It will be a whole number because we are talking about whole people and uh, population. And we can leave this length as 10 we will take the values from this demo ops etc so all i did here was to double click i will delete this and do it again that's it so we need we don't need this time anything to be equal or anything we are saying transfer to the pop 2021 which will be created this value from this field the values from this field and then we click OK and we see, in theory, immediately the effect on the attribute table. This takes a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, sir, from you may answer two questions in Q&A. In the meantime, <laughs> yes. 
I was meant to copy. I have a lot of null demo. Yes, we'll come back to the demo values. I did that and see no map, just white. Uh, that's a little bit more complicated now. Um, and I have an extra complication here that it's uh, not doing the calculation. Okay, on the null values, we will come back because this is uh, where the, we will clarify this further on. Um, the just white is a little bit more complicated. I'm not sure what they are referring to when they say I did that and I see no map just white. And we also have a non-responding to GIS here, which is worrying. <laughs> this is uh, why it is important to keep saving your work because sometimes, of course, things crash. Um, unfortunately, I will have to close the program and, and pick it up from this join. It seems it's that important. others also had the same problem in the chat. You mean with the crash? With the crash. Hmm. That's interesting, because it worked really well for us when we tested it, okay. Oh. Okay, that means we, we are overrunning a little bit, but um, let's see. Let's see what the impact of this crash was. <laughs> okay, unfortunately the, the crash has quite a major impact. <laughs> Because, um, yes, of course, it goes back to the last time we saved. And last time we saved was at the, remember when we created the map of the country. So, okay, I will share my screen again. So the crash happens to everyone. There we are. Remember, we created this country, this country map. Um, okay, we are back and. Um, I just wanted to very quickly um, wrap up the first part and, and then hand over to Amir. So let me see. Okay, just to uh, reassure you that uh, we actually achieved quite a lot because if we manage to reach this point, calculating the area and then the density, and this is where we were, we were comparing the density with the population. And then we exported the data in a simple CSV format. And here I just wanted to clarify very briefly the folders and files. Um, the zip file contained a shape file. The problem with shape file is that they have decided to call the shape file as a concept and the shape file as a file the same thing. So when we say shape file, we actually mean five files. If these are zipped and in a single folder, then they can be uploaded very quickly and easily into GIS without the need to unzip them. Otherwise, if it's a more complicated structure like with the airports where the, the zipped file contained files inside a folder 
that also had uh, files inside, then QGIS cannot read it. The file we saved, the shape file, I deliberately named the folder underscore SHP to remind myself that in there, there is a shape file. And if you look into that folder, you will see now six files. One of them is a shape file. If you want to send, transfer, move the shape file, you cannot simply move this one file. You have to zip the folder or transfer the whole folder. Remember this with zip files. There are better formats. Um, they are formats um, under development, etc. But at the moment, you saw that a lot of data is downloadable as a shape file. And finally, the CSV file we exported. It's a simple CSV file. Um, and you can see here in brief the details and the, the different uh, fields uh, as a text file. And it contains the population. The other things I had in mind was to play a little bit with the color, your color scheme. So under symbology, um, and you saw how I did this and the different patterns that you can see here. And there is a little exercise to map the uh, categorical variables that we didn't look at. The urban type, for example, which is the urban areas, the NATS3 urban areas, and the coastal areas. So color them in different uh, colors to see the patterns. And finally, I had an example there. I didn't have in mind to complete it today anyway. It's a little more complicated. How to export what you see, not as a snap, as a snip, but as a, a proper professional map. You need to open a new kind of, uh, in under project, a new print layout, and then it creates uh, a print layout that you can save as a PDF. But um, this is the very, very final stage once you are done with your, uh, with your analysis, etc., etc. So we completed the exercise for the first part, and sorry, we overrun. Amir will take over for the second part, and he will follow a slightly different pattern. He will uh, follow the steps slowly, and we don't expect exactly everyone to follow necessarily. If you are struggling with the data, if the data didn't work out, you may want to simply watch Amir doing this, and then when you receive the video to repeat it. And if you feel confident and you manage to follow until now, and then you may want to attempt what Amir has to show. So I will stop here and switch over to Amir. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Seraphim. I hope uh, you're not uh, tired. And uh, actually, what I and Seraphim prepared for you for uh, this uh, workshop was uh, honestly our uh, main or most important uh, or problematic basics or principles of QGIS that. Uh, we believe that uh, you will face in your uh, projects. So, and uh, I have a, let's say, a confession here to make that after over 15 years of working in uh, spatial data analysis, still sometimes I go back to these uh, basic concepts to be sure that uh, the project is going well. Uh, Seraphim is the witness here as we have the same problem sometimes in our meetings when we do the project. One of these uh, concepts uh, or main, import, main or important uh, principles that uh, is important in the, in the GIS in general, and when you want to do a special data analysis is to, is to have a, a uh, good uh, understanding of coordinate reference system, CRS. Uh, so already you had uh, the, some uh, experience with coordinate system CRS uh, in the beginning of the workshop, but uh, what is actually a coordinate system? So as, as you know, the plan or planet Earth is not uh, flat and is a uh, more or less a sphere uh, and uh, to be more precise it's not a sphere it's more a, a ellipsoid or a, a spheroid 
So uh, therefore, the best approximation of the our of our uh, planet Earth surface is an asteroid or an ellipsoid. Amir, sorry, you're not sharing your screen. That's your intention. You need to share your screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you that you informed me on time. Exactly, it was the time that I wanted to share. Thank you, yes. So let me share first. Okay, I hope you can uh, Seraphim, can you please help me? Yes, uh, hello, you we can see okay. your screen. Okay, okay. It was paused for yeah. a non reason. Now now yeah. I can be okay. Perfect. So so as I mentioned, so our planet Earth is a sphere and coordinate reference system is a reference system that help us to locate, to specify the place of each point or each place on this uh, surface. Uh, and it has three, actually we use three numbers, so-called coordinates uh, for doing this. But these coordinate reference systems, shortly CRS, uh, can be divided to two types. Some of these CRSs are projected coordinate uh, reference systems, and uh, some of them are geographic coordinate reference systems. What is, let's, let's first just take a look at the co geographic coordinate, uh, uh, geographic coordinate system, or shortly GCS. Uh, in geography coordinate system, we use two numbers, actually, in fact, two degrees, latitude and longitude. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with these kind of locating points. For example, we say that Tehran's coordinate is 35 degree northward and 51 degree eastward. So northward from the equator, and eastward from the prime meridian, uh, which passes through the both uh, poles and then from the Greenwich in UK. So as you see in the picture, uh, we have two degrees uh, to locate each point. So now that we, we know what is a coordinate reference system and why do we need them, uh, and I, we have an idea about geographic coordinate system, which was somehow familiar for, for all of us. Uh, it's good to have an idea, what is a projected coordinate system and why do we need them in a special data analysis? So obviously when we want to do some analysis with data, which are special, in addition to the table, attributes which is the case in the general data analysis we had the features of or the characteristics of the our data is that they have some uh they have some uh um, let's say special uh coordinates or they are uh, a special referenced so we need a coordinate system to locate them and do the special analysis but Usually, we should first map these coordinates from the sphere uh, to the map or to a flat two dimensional map. This can map be to a, traditionally a paper map or, uh, or our map in the softwares in our desktop computers and so on. For this purpose, we have something so called projection and projection for, for having an idea of how a projection works. I'm sure many of you already are familiar with this projection uh, concept, but uh, it's, 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 it's worth just going through it once. 
imagine that we have an imaginary uh, source of light at the center of this planet Earth or this asteroid. Then we have the planet Earth totally transparent. Now the grid of equator and parallel equators and uh, uh, longitudes uh, parallel are uh, depicted on the surface. So, and this is the family of projections. We have three types, cylindrical, conical, as you see, A is cylindrical, B is conical, and C is so-called planar or azimuthal. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, as Zarafim also mentioned at the beginning, it's very difficult to have the lecture with no interaction with uh, participants, as also I have this, uh, I got, I got used to uh, having the interaction with the audience and I set my speed and change everything uh, based on the feedbacks. But now I have nothing, but it's, it's really difficult. But I hope you are with me and if you have any question, so uh, I can explain more. But I guess so far we are in the basics. Uh, then, and the most important one, which I want you to, to, to focus on, is the cylindrical, which uh, is more useful for uh, distance uh, measurements and analysis, but others also are good for different purposes. And uh, so, in fact, we go from the three-dimensional, uh, let's say, space to two-dimensional with this, with this projection. Let's go forward and this is one type of or i can say the most famous uh co projected coordinate system which is universal transverse mercator uh as a crs as a coordinate system but as a uh, projected coordinate system it is the more common the most common uh project projected uh, coordinate system around the world and the reason is that it is precise for each zones. So one problem with UTM as a as a kind of cylindrical. Uh, uh, Amir, sorry, yes. uh, your slides are not uh, moving. Maybe you're not on presentation mode. Is it uh, is it now in the UTM slide or not? No, no, it's not. Uh, oh, which you may want to stop sharing I'm, the screen and start again. Yeah, maybe I'm now in the PDF and in the presentation yeah. mode okay what about now is still the same problem surfing sorry i i don't think i can see your slides okay now everything yeah, should be okay. Yeah, it's worth okay. 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 So now the slides are changing, true? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Everything works fine. Oh, uh, did, uh, most probably a uh, uh, participant didn't see this page, true? Yeah, but they we heard you. So you okay, can okay, okay, yeah. yeah, of course. So I just want to uh, repeat that the UTM is one of the cylindrical. Uh, coordinate projected coordinate systems and uh, so one problem with uh cylindrical uh coordinate projected coordinate system is that as we go further from the point that uh this uh, this let's say paper touches the is, is, is sphere uh we have the more distortion here the the paper touches the sphere at the equator but it can touch the sphere in any point. So as a result, the idea behind UTM is that it's divided into 60 different equal zones. Each one is 60 degree. Then this is the reason, as you see in the photos in left and right, for the Europe uh, and for the, these 60 degree narrow uh lines we can use different utms uh with the acceptable very good uh 
uh, precision for uh, measuring uh, some diff, uh, let's say, distances, areas, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and actually, one thing is that, as I mentioned, in the geography coordinate system before projection, we have degrees, but now we have met meters for our measurements and we need this and you will see in this in the exercise in some minutes that uh, why we need this uh, meter for our uh, project for our statistical uh, special analysis so and uh, let's go to geoprocessing tools i don't go in more details about the buffer and so on because already seraphim mentioned them and as we are uh, we do not have enough time it would be a bit repeating and so but geoprocessing tools all those tools and uh, process pro, uh, processes that let us into manipulate data for our own purposes for our own uh, that, uh special data analysis uh goals and uh, mainly they are based on the concept of overlay you see here that uh, in, in, the, in most of the uh, geoprocessing tools, we have two layers. First layer is uh, the imported layer, and the second one is uh, overlaid layer. And in intersection, the algorithm behind this in GIS just considered and just keep the intersection, those areas which are within the both polygons and just uh, consider this as a new polygon. And in Union, we have uh, all the areas inside the both polygons, or let's say the both layers in one new, as a one new polygon. And obviously it considers the, uh, the repeated or the intersection only once. And symmetrical difference, is somehow obvious what is happening, the intersection is eliminated, and the difference, what, what, what is important about the difference is that uh, in, in other type of overlay, uh, more or less it's not so important, or if we are not sure of, or we mistakenly uh, select the input layer and over, over, overlaying layer, uh, we will receive the same result. But in difference, you should care about the importing layer and uh, overlaying layer. So, one thing, one another thing which is important is that map overlay features have different types. So we already know that uh, in GIS we have three different geometrical features: points, lines, and polygons. So for for overlaying. Uh, the, the good thing is that we can overlay any of these uh, interchangeably, like point with point even, line, polygon, and uh, polygon with line, and so on. So, on, and also we can count, for example, uh, points inside a polygon. You know, it is something one is the third or after doing the intersection, after calculating what is within uh, the polygon and what is outside the polygon with respect to the topology in the in the in the logic behind the GIS, it starts it starts counting the number of points inside the polygon. So I try to go a bit faster. I do not go uh, in detail about the buffer. Uh, only thing maybe to add is that the logic behind the buffer for the software. And for the, for the algorithm behind this buffer is to divide the whole map uh, with, with two, in two groups, in two classes. Those regions outside the polygon of this uh, buffer, Seraphim has already uh, mentioned that buffer is a polygon. If we, we buffer around the points or multi, um, uh, multi, multi line or uh, sorry, poly, uh, polyline or polygons, no difference. We will have some areas, some polygons. So it will uh, separate which areas are inside this polygon and which areas are outside the polygon. 
one other thing uh, which I believe uh, uh, Seraphim also mentioned is that these buffers can be remained intact or uh, or be uh, dissolved. In the left, you can see the dissolved buffers, and here the buffers are uh, in the right. Buffers are remained intact. So why do we need this? You know, sometimes we care about the intersection areas. For example, we want to know or we want to uh, treat these intersected areas differently. For, for, uh, for example, we may need to see what residential areas in a city uh, have services or can receive or can be served uh, services from two different, at least, I mean, more than at least two, or let's say more than one service uh, center, then we should let them be. Otherwise, or in the case that we only care about, uh, let's say, uh, safety buffer about uh, around the residential areas, we want to know that which is the buffer that outside this buffer, we are allowed to do some construction, let's say, then we, we can use this dissolved areas. And uh, these are other examples of uh, the, the importance of buffer and why I selected a buffer for you for the ex exercise that in some minutes you will start. Uh, so for protected zones, safe, safety buffers, like here around the buildings or for catchment areas, Seraphim already mentioned this. So uh, I try to hopefully if Zoom does not crash, I will uh, stop sharing and So now you should be able to see me again. Yes. And now I'm trying to. Open a QGIS. And I have shared with everyone a link to your presentation so that they can okay. follow the exercise if they wish. Mm -hmm. So. I guess now you should be able to see uh, one QGIS project. Yes, we see okay. the air, okay. airplanes. Okay, yeah, but uh, we should delete them as <laughs> we do not need them. Why save? No, no. Okay. Discard. So. You should start. Let let me also have my presentation to do not miss anything here. Okay, so please open your uh, QGIS again from the beginning. I do not uh, want you to have the previous uh, uh, project open as it may uh, occur some problem for us. Then, as is in the presentation, please uh, create a new project, which is already now I'm created, which is created in my project. Then at the almost the same uh, shape files as uh, we had in the, the first uh, part of the workshop. I guess this is the polygon. Oh, mm -hmm. As soon as you add the first uh, uh, layer, the project will uh, be automatically set to the CRS of that layer. So now, because this polygon has the, uh, maybe you, you see this EP 
GS here. Uh, as we have, uh, as, as our layer had this projection or CRS, let's say, coordinate system, we have now uh, the, the projection, the, the whole project in the same uh, CRS. Do not close uh, the data source manager and continue adding. Now you can add the airport shapefile So, you know, the shapefile, this, oh, I, I, will, I will let you know later. Now I cannot show you this. And what else? We also need the centroids. There should be this. No. Okay, select close. I actually do not need these boundaries just to make the view a little bit cleaner I remove it. So uh, the thing is that, first of all, make sure that uh, the order of layers is in the way that polygons are below and then lines and then points. Otherwise it will, uh, overlap each other and you will not be able to see uh, layers correctly. So here, if you uh, hover the mouse on each of the layer, you can get some information about the layer. The CRS here is 1335, as you did uh, set for the uh, first uh, exercise. But here, this is not 3035, you see, it has a different projection, but still the projection, the, the CRS of the project is 3035 because it gets the, uh, the first layers uh, CRS. I'm trying to go as fast as I can for you to be with me. So what should I do next? Now, I need to change to uh, change the CRS, but uh, I need to save and make a copy of this shapefile, this time with the correct CRS, with the needed CRS. So where is it? The CRS here, 3035. And uh, please click the add saved file to the map in order to open it for you, save it in the same uh, location as your project. Actually, I do not need the old one, so I just put it here. And to recognize the new shape file, which you see has the has the 30 35 CRS. So now I have the uh, new shape file with uh, uh, preferred CRS. One quiz is that, uh, why should we do that? Actually, I prefer you to write some answers actually. Uh, although I cannot see them very much, uh, but uh, so I will give you the answer in some seconds. Uh, just because uh, Amir, just a second. I, I just wanted to clarify one thing because um, the point data, can you, uh, can you point to the NATS point data, switch all the others off so that people can see? Yes. Yes, thank you. So this data set, um, it seems that uh, we did not ask people to download it explicitly. So I have placed it in the chat. There is a link there. You can download the data directly. It's the same data set like from the NUTS uh, website. And it's the regions that you have, but without the boundaries, only the points, the centroids. 
And then yes. Amir, uh, I wasn't sure what the question you asked. You may want to repeat the question so that people can understand what you were asking. Sure. So the question was, uh, why, as, as we have in this slide, they can also, uh, you can also read the quiz inside the slide. We are in the C3. Uh, why should we save the shapefile, this new copy of the shapefile, in the EPSG 3035? So actually, we should do this as, let us show you something. Now, the next step is that I want to do a buffer around, let me show the airports. These are airports. And I want to do some, to create some uh, buffers inside the vector menu, geoprocessing tool that I already uh, introduced to you. And I, I mentioned the idea bef uh, behind them and then buffer. Then I want to create a buffer around each of these uh, airports with let's say 10 kilometer. But unfortunately the software does not let me to change it to kilometer. What is the problem? In fact, it is saved in the CRS, in a, in a kind of CRS, which is a still using, which is still uses the degree, as I mentioned, not the, not the meter for, the, for locate, location, for locating uh, the points on the planet. This was the reason that we changed it to a projected coordinate system, which uses meter, you can go also to the property and go to the source and, uh, oh, sorry, to the information. And here you should find more information usually about the, about the CRS that you selected. You can read about the CRS, what, what kind of coordinate system uh, you have selected, and uh, you, there is accuracy uh, information for you at best one tenth of meters. So you see the, <coughs> the units is in meter, not in degree. But if you go back to the original shape file, you will see the units is, in, it is a geography coordinate system and method is latitude and longitude in degree. So now that I have the shapefile in a correct CRS, I would like to change the symbology in order to have a better uh, and clear map. But for you, if you do not have the Topo Airport here, you should uh, open the, let me do it again. You should click on the layer, then properties, then sim select symbology. And here select the topology. You can also select all symbols, but topology will show you uh, the only uh, topology uh, class uh, <clears throat> symbols. Then you can simply select the symbol and apply. Okay, so you see now again the, the airplanes are back in our map. So to be honest, I don't like the color of the nuts regions. To have a more clear map, I also click on the layer property, I go to symbology and I change the color here. So maybe something a bit lighter is a good background for our purpose. So now you see airports inside lands. Also, if you like, you can go to properties 
and add label if you are curious to know where are you on the map and name latin should show you the uh, area's name and but this 10 is a big size for your map just maybe go to five if you couldn't do that or if you uh, do not uh, do not like to have the labels please uh, skip this i don't want to add to the complexity uh, of the uh, exercise for you i guess oh uh, yes and now i have also some information but very very small but you can still read it so what is the next the next step already is we already did the c4 we are in the c5 step now we open the attribute table of the airport uh, layer from the attribute table please go to the icon this icon which is select features using an expression if there is any question i'm ready to answer seraphim otherwise i will continue i assume that everyone or at least 99 percent are with us yes it seems that there are no questions please continue there is a break coming up soon anyway for okay yeah uh, how much time uh, i have to finish the exercise seraphim based on our yes. you have 15 minutes 15 minutes it's okay yeah okay so then here we need to write an expression please keep your notice here because i want to speed up now again find the fields and values it is the columns in the table and go to the air pass where is it here and you see that the type is also number air pass if you double click on it it will be written here then click on the equal to now i need to know what i have in this column so i click on the all unique values in this column in the table i hope you can see this here yes you see air p pass has nine zero one and two only these uh, numbers and not else anything else so one and two are active uh, airports that we need for our uh, selection we want to select these airports so i selected that please select all the air, uh, airports with air pass equal to one or air pass equal to two so we are done with the expression you can see the preview if the preview is not null or error or something your expression at least has a meaning there is no guarantee that the expression that you have written is uh, what you want but at least it makes sense since its syntax is okay then select feature then you see in the background that I close this you can you see that uh, some rows or some entities some airports are selected also in the map you see them as yellow and also you can check here selected are selected features of 320 if you want to see them all on the top you can press this icon here now i have all the selections on the top so i'm done with the selection now let me zoom to the selection you see for in the all in the whole layer all uh, airports with that specific features are selected now i want to do some special analysis only around the, and about these airports i go to vector menu and processing tool, bar, tool tools and then buffer as you see we have meter i change this to kilometer because meter is 
too small and do not forget that tick this box. Otherwise, it will be done for the whole airports. 10 kilometer is not enough for me. 50 kilometer does make sense. I would suggest to uh, increase the segments to 10 to have a more a smooth circle or a buffer around uh, your features. But you can set it to 25 or even more. But five sometimes for 50 kilometer gives you uh, an unclean uh, circle. Then others are not relevant for our purpose. If we had time, I will come back, but I don't think so. And I will explain what are these others. And if you do not want to have a temporary file and you need this file later, just save the file in your location. So we mentioned that, please name this air. Sorry, I guess the name is... So, Seraphim, we are already in the second part of the exercise. I'm happy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, you're doing well. You may want to, um, when you select, when you enter the file name, just uh, remind people the kilometers that you entered. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean here? Yes, I didn't add the kilometer to the name, just not to have a very old uh, name, but we know that 50 kilometer is the reason that we call this uh, shape file. Okay. So air buffer 50 kilometer is the name. We selected, oh, yes, yes. And yes, it's because this, this distance has all these zeros, so um, it switched back to meters, you see. Ah, okay. How did it happen? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, then, okay, we are ready, I guess. Nothing else has changed, I guess. We can press the run. So it was very fast. If you would uh, select 10, like 15, it would be a bit longer. Uh, okay, now we have a new shape file. I do not need these airports anymore, at least for now. I put them there. And uh, now I want to know uh, more about these airports. I want to know that uh, which of these airports are serving uh, multiple nuts, uh, nuts regions and what are the, which of these airports only serve one or two nuts. So, uh, do you have any idea how we can do this based on uh, today's lecture? I would like you to participate in this part. As I said, I do not have any face. I cannot interact with you with the voice and your faces. So it is really difficult, believe me. But, uh, but, but there is a quick question. Um, someone is asking, for example, how would they know what to choose one and two etc and be, because uh, it would be nice to see the attribute table of the airports and of the buffers to see what is in there right so yes, yes. so this is a data set that um, we downloaded it was available online and it came with a file, a PDF in there that is called metadata. You can have a look at the metadata file that came together. Uh, we don't need to do it now, Amir. And, and in there, these columns, these fields are explained. And we identified that um, what we think are active airports is categories one and two. It is not, it is a dated file. It's not very clear. But from inspecting the map, we figured out that it's probably the right, uh, the right kind of airports. Yes, thank you. Yes, actually, this was uh, something that uh, we also discussed with Seraphim. Yes, and you are right. And thank you, Seraphim, for the explanation. So now you see we have the buffer. And the buffer, it is good to mention that the buffer has the same attribute table as the main uh, uh, layer. The only difference is that 
this was a point layer and now we have a polygon layer which is the buffer around each uh, airport i still i have the same question uh, can you tell me how we can we can see also keep in mind that we have the nuts centroids which are the points which are geometrically center of each nuts area it makes our analysis much easier you see let's go in one of them maybe it makes sense yeah you see in the center of each nuts area we have a centroid so the way that we can do this is going to vector obviously because we are today working with vectors not rasters which are photos and pixels then we go to analysis tools so count points in polygon is the analysis that we need let me check if okay before going there i it's okay we can continue uh so then we need to count numbers of centroids number of points inside each buffer what we should select first i should select the polygon and then the line which includes the centroids this is the centroids and i didn't select anything so i cannot click this box here so and i can change the name of the new created field which will be only the number of points uh here to in an, to a name that makes more sense more sense for my project but for some reason i let it be so as it is then i save this in the same way and what is the proposed name here underline count underline nuts and uh, that's it it will automatically will be saved as shapefile and we can press run so i have i close i make other layers disappear just uh to show what we have what we created we had this air buffer 50 and now we created a new layer and we saved it it's not a temporary file uh and the attribute table is exactly the same as the buffer shape file with one extra column which is the num num points or the number of points inside each area each each buffer uh maybe i'm not satisfied with the naming what we can do in the next slide in the c11 or no actually c10 in the c10 i'm i described this you can go to properties and to the fields click to the uh, and toggle the editing mode otherwise you cannot edit the shape file and the attribute table you should let the software to do this then you can change the name to num underline nuts number of nuts maybe apply again please toggle the editing mode otherwise it will not be saved and apply and okay now open the attribute table you will see that the name is already changed i only have i guess something around five minutes and what we should do next is c11 symbology So now I have the areas that I zoom in the whole map somehow. Here is the whole map. And uh, I have these uh, airports 
but this time with uh, some infor new information. We know that which airport uh, serves to how many how 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 many nuts nuts regions. I go to properties, then symbology. I select graduated. Uh, there is a question here. I want you to think while I'm doing it, and after that, I will answer. Why not categorized and why graduated? Which one is correct and why we should select this? And then select the value of number nuts, number of nuts. I prefer to add the number of classes to six. And as soon as you do this, it will be automatically classified. Otherwise, you should press the classify. I press it. It's free and I can press it. But I do not like the equal count. For some reasons, I like natural breaks. Natural breaks gives me more uh, realistic or not realistic, more, uh, more appropriate uh, breaks to the purpose of my project. You can see the differences. Equal count, zero to one airports, which uh, can serve one or zero or one not area. And at last we have seven to 38. It's not so much information for me, but natural breaks gives me a more uh, useful categorization then i would say as it's already read and i like it to be read okay yes now it's okay apply you see we have the final map in the c to l in the c to l you can see the result the result of your spatial data analysis you already analyzed uh, this data especially and uh, i want you to be sure that what you learned during these three different exercises in this workshop uh to to from our uh, perspective from from our pers perspective was the most important information that i believe that you need to know uh, to be confident uh, in starting special data analysis in QGIS. Of course, there are more information and principles, but uh, if you can do this for your own and you, you, you do some other special data analysis by your own, um, please be confident that uh, you are doing good and you can, you can do some projects for your purposes, for educational or, or uh, for job purposes. Uh, I am already done, but I would like, yeah. I have I some minutes. I would I mean, like to- Please don't forget to save. <laughs> oh yes, that's that's the most <laughs> principled <guys. laughs> Forget everything and just remember that, please save. <laughs> and now I save it as project of, so, now is the time that you answer me. Why graduate? Why graduate? Graduated. As you will not answer me in voice, I will answer it. So, if we go to properties, I have maybe one or two minutes. I will use it. Uh, if I select categorized, let's see what will happen. Nothing. Huh? Oh, yeah. You see. I have too many colors, how I can recognize them. And maybe I am i do not care about the default. For my purpose, there is no difference between a, an airport which serves 10 unit uh, knots and 13 knots, you know? I'm just uh, more curious to know how approximately they are serving different knots. So this was one, uh, one reason. And actually I wanted to you to know that uh, theoretically, categorization was the best uh, thing to choose, but you should you should decide ba based on your project's purpose. This was one 
thing and what other other thing that which is I asked here as a quiz, I guess, why can not we set the symbology to Topo Airport again? I, I would like to change these circles like airplane again. Why I cannot change it? You know, I go to symbology. Can someone please type in the chat? I have a good prize for the one who can answer me. Um, I cannot find it. Why? So, as we do not have time, Seraphim, do we have any winner? No, we don't have, but people can think about it a little bit. I wanted to show, since we have two more minutes, Samir, thank you for this. That was fascinating and it worked really well. It didn't crash on you like it did for me. I wanted to show, um, ah, we do have an answer. Really? <laughs> um, because they are not points, but because I'm not allowed to tell names, to say names because it's recorded, then I will not say who wins. Uh, they are polygons and airplanes are the symbols for points, so it's a point symbol and what we are mapping the buffers are polygons. But I wanted to show um, in two minutes, not necessarily how to do it, um, but one more little thing. So what Amir did was to take um, the buffers of the airports, so each one of these circles is a buffer for the airport, and overlay them on top of the nuts areas, but the points of the nuts areas, um, and then calculate simply how many of these nuts areas fall under each buffer. So it's a very simple, what we call point in polygon analysis. But if you want to do something a little bit more sophisticated, you may want to ask, what, how much of every nuts area, right? Underneath you can see the nuts areas. How much of every nuts area is covered by these buffers? Which is now a slightly more complex analysis. And I will show you very quickly in one minute how to do it. Okay, let's go to the simple fill here. You can also see that you can have a transparent fill with a solid outline and you can change the stroke to red for example and change it to something else so you can see how the different buffers overlay so if we want to know how much of this area and of this area falls in each buffer then the analysis we want to do is vector geoprocessing and you clip this is also called cookie cutting so you want to cookie cut the two layers. And the question is always, which one is your cookie cutter? This is always very confusing for people. I always have to try it at least twice <laughs> before I get it right. If you get it right then, and you use the buffers for the airports, and um, actually, I'm never sure. We will try it and see what happens. Um, we will use the input layer is the nuts three areas and the cookie cutter is then the buffer uh, for the airports okay i will uh, open out it after running the algorithm okay everything else is correct and run let's see what happens this takes a lot of time so I am concerned that maybe I'm using the wrong data set a little bit, <laughs> but we will see the result. Okay, it works. So you can see now why it's called cookie cutting. If you switch off all the other layers, there you go, your cookies. And underneath you see the areas that these airports save, serve. The other thing I think I did as I was clipping, I dissolved the boundaries of the airports. You can see they were overlapping and now they are not. If I go here and select one of the circles, for example. Okay, this worked, this worked. So they are independent there. And then it tells you also which buffer they fall in. So this is another way of doing this analysis. I tried it as well 
here. There you go. Without dissolving the areas, and you can see how the different areas overlap. So in this case, if we select one of these circles, we know which areas underneath and what percentage of the area falls in. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen here. Um, this was just uh, one step further, basically, from um, a point in polygon to a, an overlay with polygons with a clipping, which is also called cookie cutting. And as Amir showed earlier, and as you saw under the uh, vector operations, there are many different ways to do this. It's also in the slides, some notification. And you need to think beforehand very carefully, what sort of analysis do you want to do when you do this kind of special analysis? And also I would like to stress that the important thing here is to have your data cleaned up to a certain point. You saw how many problems we had with downloading the dance data, taking it at face value, and then thinking, oh, there are all these data overlaying, we have to separate it, we have to clean it, then downloading the airport data and realizing that, hmm, these are too many airports, they include every single airport, including military airports. We need to separate the airports we're interested in to do the analysis. So a lot of time when we um, do GIS and spatial analysis is actually spent in cleaning the data and making sure that the data we are entering into our analysis is the correct data set. And then the operations, if it doesn't crash, <laughs> only take a few minutes, but the cleaning up of the data takes much, much longer. And what we wanted to achieve today was, first of all, to uh, help you download, set up your environment and run it uh, with some confidence, explain a little bit around these um, geographical coordinates and the different systems, and then all the data we provided is widely available. We have provided the links so that you can download it. We wanted to stress that behind uh, a, a GIS, what you have in terms of data is tables. And basically these are all one form or another of table operations. Even the sophisticated overlays are actually operating underneath at the coordinate system. The algorithms are reading various tables that you may not have access to. Remember, you couldn't see the area. You had to recalculate it. It is stored somewhere in one of these files. And then we wanted to um, show you as well how some of these buzzwords like buffering or overlaying or point in polygon analysis, how can they be performed? and what do they actually, what is the outcome of this? What we didn't show you is how to create a professional map. This is all maps um, on the fly created. You can save your project, but um, if you want to create a professional map for publications, etc., you need to follow uh, the slide I have there where you create a layout. And, um, and then we also showed you how to export some of this data as CSV files if you want to take them into another uh, software. We still have about 10 minutes left. I don't see any questions uh, either on the chat or on the Q&A. If you have any, please post them. And I am uh, very, very happy to say that we still have 49 participants. Okay, three of us <laughs> are here, so 46 uh, persevered with us. Thank you very much. Uh, we do realize that these are not very easy tasks if someone has not used uh, GIS before. And if you're using it for the first time and you manage to complete the exercises, well done. If not, the material will be posted to you. Um, and then your data will be deleted. You will not retain your data unless you requested to join the newsletter. So uh, stay assured that we will not uh, use your data for commercial purposes or anything. We just want to communicate with, um, with you the, the training material. Uh, there is a question there, because we insisted on all these CRS 3035, etc., you need to do a little bit of reading around this. This was European level data. The 3035 CRS is a good one because when you cover the whole of Europe, if you focus in specific countries, you need to think uh, which, which ones to use. 
usually or sometimes the metadata of the data you download tells you which um, is the best projection system to use. Um, okay, uh, how did you know that the area of the first exercise was in meters? That's another good question. Uh, the area of the first exercise. Yes, this is, um, this is some of this information that you learn after years and years of engaging with data and GIS. And sometimes I also forget myself and I calculate the areas of the perimeters and then I have to go back to my map and actually measure it physically to remind myself, double check that yes, here I am calculating meters or kilometers or square kilometers. So it, it stresses the importance of metadata. When you get hold of data, if there are files that um, are called metadata or explanation or readme, and uh, usually the information is there that tells you the projection system, what sort of coordinates they're using, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yes, and always double check. Remember how many times I opened the attribute table, Amir as well. We, we, we keep all the operations we do, we open the attribute table to check that things happen the way we were expecting them to happen. If something doesn't look right, either QGIS will crash, <laughs> if you ask how it is very complicated, or it will not look right in the, in the attribute table. Some of these things are logical. So when you calculate, for example, density and the densities are all below one um, decimals for the whole of Europe, it means maybe you did something wrong there. And a final question that I see is, uh, Oh, sorry, I have two more things here. One more question on the chat. Um, is it possible for calculating the distances between each buffer? So this is a bit complex. Some of the buffers are overlaying. Um, yes, you need to find a way to work out the centroids, but the question really is the distance between the points. So there are operations because the buffers, remember, were created from points. There are uh, operations to calculate the nearest uh, point distance, for example, if you look under vector. Um, so it identifies the nearest point and the distance to the nearest point, or you can specify a distance and then it selects all the points within this distance. And a lot of this information is through uh, searching the internet basically. So when you come up with an idea that you think you want to achieve or an operation, um, usually I do the same. Sometimes I don't remember the exact command. So the help system helps a lot. A good book <laughs> helps. Um, I can recommend, I will add in my uh, final version of the slides, a couple of good books for QGIS. The help system that is online, the material online for QGIS is very good, the training material. And uh, many of these things you need to think about what do I want to do and then how to express it and find the right answer. Um, okay, doing your own analysis in a different statistical package, what's the best way of importing the relevant variables into a shapefile for mapping it? Um, CSV or TXT. So remember, you need to have some sort of geography as a shapefile, we had the NATS level geography. In other contexts, you may have different types of geography. I showed you examples, for example, with school locations or with uh, districts of school, school districts um, in one of my examples. So a lot depends on what sort of shapefile you have or other geographical file for the geographical information. And um, so that you can then save the analysis that you have done, remember, with some sort of unique identifier so that you can then match it. And I save things as CSV. CSV is a text format. And, and I usually save it as CSV because it reminds me that it's comma separated while the text can be, for example, tab separated or some other thing separated values. And CSV is a little bit more of a standard. And, I don't see any other questions um, apart from maybe one uh, personal support <laughs> after this session. <laughs> this is uh, a little bit complicated because we have been uh, 
uh, commission, so to speak, to deliver this particular training with as much uh, information and resources as we can. Um, now, we are open to suggestions, for example, for potential collaboration, for research, etc. But we cannot really provide one-to-one -one training uh, for these sessions. There are training schools around, there are training courses. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are paid for, that you can um, follow up with. So it's not the purpose of this um, course to provide one-to-one -one training per se, just to give you some idea and to maybe kind of feel, make you feel a little bit confident that you can uh, go download uh, the software and, and uh, do some analysis. Um, so thank you to everyone. And uh, yes, it's been great having you here, even if we didn't have the chance to interact with you face to face. Mm -hmm.